Thanks for joining us here today for our webinar where we'll be discussing some of the various roles that artificial intelligence plays in modern day warehouse operations. My name is Chuck Harris. I'm Vice President of Sales for MHS Distribution and Fulfillment Division. And I'm joined by my colleagues, Brandon Coates, who is our Director of Product Development for Robotic Technologies, and Bruce Blykamp, who is our Director of Product Management. The images on the screen are meant to simply show the difference between a typical manufacturing operation as opposed to more complicated applications of robotics that are typically found in today's order fulfillment facilities. At its highest level, we can think of artificial intelligence as facilitating these more dynamic tasks that were difficult to automate previously. With that understanding of AI, what does this mean for the warehouse? In aggregate, the value prop is that leveraging AI and machine learning in the warehouse means faster, more efficient, order fulfillment with fewer manual touch points and ultimately superior customer satisfaction. More specifically, think of AI as a great enabler, capable of automating processes that have long been targets for automation, but proved too complex for technology available at that time. To be more specific, manufacturing operations move the same widget exact same way every time. But that same generation of automation struggled to be effective with the variety of workflows and items found in distribution centers. So what does automation need to be able to thrive in e-commerce driven environments? In general, handle highly variable work pieces and highly variable work environments. So what's necessary to make that jump from consistent action in a controlled environment to handling a variety in a dynamic, unstructured environment? Is that too good to be true? Are these capabilities only possible with highly programmed demos? Also, while there is a picture of Apollo 11 launch, uh, don't worry, we're going to get to that shortly. Uh, many of you may be familiar with Moore's Law. Uh, this is a very important principle for both uh, capability and cost. It states that we can expect the speed and capability of our computers to increase every couple of years and that we will pay less for them. Compared to the Apollo 11 mission, today's smartphones have more than 100,000 times the processing power than computers used in the moon landing. Uh, they're also far less expensive. It's Moore's law in action. And the power to put a man on the moon, compounding over 50 plus years, has affected more than just our smartphones. A range of technologies are experiencing such growth, compounding, and are now continually merging to enable modern day AI. Grippers that use sensors to provide feedback and allow for adjustment during pick. Sensors that are deployed on machines to capture changes in state and predict future status. Software, which touches almost every aspect of the various tasks within the four walls of the warehouse, from creating optimal product flow through workload balancing up to intelligent routing based on various flow conditions. And robotics that leverage uh, vision and learning, such as shape recognition, optimal approach to pick, or even mixed skew palletization. In short, as the systems get smarter and can perform more tasks within the warehouse, the technology may actually become less costly and more capable over time. So I just mentioned that software is critical in almost every aspect of order fulfillment and that artificial intelligence is enabling more functionality and ultimately improving the overall productivity in modern day warehouses. Let's hear from Bruce Blykamp on some specific examples of how and where software does this. Bruce. Thanks, Chuck. In today's modern warehouse or distribution center, there are normally a hierarchy of controls and systems. At the client level, there are business processes running on ERP, MES, and WMS systems that manage the business. We live, and what we're talking about today is at the execution level, which is where WES and WCS level of controls are found. WES stands for Warehouse Execution System. WCS stands for Warehouse Control System. Really, the WS is, is meant to uh, establish that it's a, a smarter level WCS level control. So at this level, we manage the active inventory, the routing of materials and orders through the facility in any automated processes, be they picking cells, sortation systems, or buffering systems. Ultimately, all these different systems have to come together to get customer orders out of the door accurately and efficiently. Looking at an example, an e-com company receives orders from the host level, orders are passed down to the WMS, and ultimately the WCS, WES will execute those orders. This can be hundreds of thousands of orders today and even more individual items. 
whether the picking and assembly is done manually or automatically, the WES, WCS directs the people and equipment through the process. Many people process these uh, orders in batches of like products or families of products that often go together on orders. Modern WES, WCS systems look for this commonality can group like products together. The benefit is much higher picking rates. We are executing a project today that processes 40,000 orders per day and over 90,000 individual items. The WCS manages the inventory with the buffer storage systems, plans the batches, sequences the orders across various processes with different production rates, looking to balance the work as best as possible to maximize the overall picking rate. The goal is simple, process orders efficiently with 100% accuracy and 100% traceability for every item on every order. This is all done dynamically, managing the disparate workflows so that every process is running well at all times. Thanks, Bruce. Now we're going to go back to Brandon and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about predictive analytics. Thanks, Chuck. Keeping our customer production operations in operations is the main goal for predictive analytics. In order to take on this challenge, a developer will have to understand which KPIs are most important to a given operation. Due to a variety of business drivers and customer preferences, there's no one-to-one -one lexicon for mapping these metrics between the application and the sensors and software tracking the data. However, there are certainly repeating themes that will emerge. Take a conveyor or a sorter as example. Each is a combination and assortment of static and dynamic structures and components. How will these MHE typically fail? Belt failure, bearing failure, and drive failure. Each of these failures can have its own detection mode. In motors, we can often monitor amperage levels. In bearing and belt applications, we might use an accelerometer. For each application, the sensor allowing the monitoring of the data is opened up to allow tracking of the data. In addition to the sensor, this requires a compute module, a database, and a connection to a network for access to the data in real time, or one allowing periodic transmission of the data. What is the data? Nothing more than a series of digital information that matches the time series data of the device. Once the data is in hand, a developer will sculpt an algorithm around the data set to understand statistical relationships in that data. This starts by baselining the data, computing the average and standard deviation of the data set, followed by leveraging the process capability index to calculate the upper and lower control limits for the process in question. The baseline data model for the new equipment then allows for predictive analytics to be performed. We can do this either through a regression modeling and trend lines or in a more modern context by training machine learning algorithms on the data signature or a good piece of material handling equipment versus a poor quality material handling equipment in need of service. As the data is presented to the model, it can output which signature is more like the input signal and by threshold of the result, we can plan downtime in lieu of experiencing unplanned downtime events. So what is the additional business benefit for the additional effort? We can identify failures and performance degradations in data modeling for individual assets and for entire systems before downtime occurs, leading to higher operational profitability for the organization. Predictive analytics solutions capable of addressing the unique challenges of automation and logistics hubs are just now being clearly understood, and there is an immense opportunity for organizations stepping in today and focusing in on individual assets by their level of criticality to the overall system. By homing in on one piece of material handling equipment at a time, every organization can sustain continuous improvement and profitability for years to come via predictive analytics. All right, well, that's probably enough on predictive analytics. Let's take it back over to Bruce and talk a little bit about AGVs and AMRs. Thanks, Brandon. Now we're going to watch a short video uh, on AMRs. As a short introduction, AMRs are quick and easy to install based on their autonomous guidance technology that use a combination of sensors and software such that vehicles can navigate freely within a defined area in your facility. AMRs use sophisticated mapping algorithms to learn the world around them and harness that data to constantly gauge their location and adapt to their environment. The robots work in tandem to find the most efficient route for a task, leading to an increase in optimization, productivity, and reliability. 
What you saw in the video was uh, AMRs. They're using LiDAR technology, vision, and other sensors to look for known fixtures and items within your facility in order to know their location and determine what routes they're going to use to get to their next destination. The generically named Fleet Manager is a software that is used to build a map, interpret the features that they see, both fixed targets and or obstacles to avoid. Paths are determined by the software, and the system can and will consider other known obstacles seen by other vehicles in the system in other areas, and look at congestion as well to and avoid certain areas based on either obstacles or uh, too much uh, AGV AMR traffic. The WCS can add another layer of intelligence to this as, it wor as work builds in the facility, either around defined times or defined uh, or orders that are being received. The fleet manager can direct AGVs and AMRs to stage in areas in advance of the actual workload changing. That means the AMRs have been pre-positioned so that when the actual work arrives, they can more efficiently respond to that. The inputs again could be orders that are being dropped in certain zones or known workflows that occur every day or every week at the same time. The system would then redirect. Re Thanks, Brandon. Now we're going to watch a short video uh, on AMRs. As a short introduction, AMRs are quick and easy to install. Brandon? Yeah, thanks, Bruce. Next up, we're going to discuss robotics, specifically a couple robotics applications that are highly leveraged in AI. So first up is sorter induction. Today, we're able to effectively use robotics in the process of sorter induction by upstream pre-singulation and singulation of the package profiles. Singulation is the process of taking bulk flow of packages or goods and creating a single file stream of product. In logistics, this is typically done just before a sorter. Sorters require one package at a time in order to operate as they feature dynamic carrier modules which route an item to a specific output point on the MHG, typically grouped by zip codes or by truck for which the item is destined. Robotic singulation is an application driven by low footprint availability and the need for decentralized operation of the robotic equipment for singulation. In order to achieve robotic singulation, intelligent software for vision, reliable and robust grasping of the end of arm tool, and autonomous path planning of the robot are all needed. Intelligent vision and grasping are now tied together by machine learning algorithms. Vision functionality itself is highly leveraged in an AI. This broad term AI encompasses all required logic for data pre-processing, heuristics methods in creating functional work streams, as well as target definition and prioritization for the robot for successful pick selection of the material to be handled. While the latest in convolutional neural networks are certainly a part of the solution, these super nonlinear modeling tools are insufficient on their own to provide the entire solution. That stated, they often can produce item type detection in regions of interest, along with intelligent tool selection to maximize robotic production. When the total solution is pulled together in uptimes of greater than 99% are attained, these solutions deliver direct value to the customer in form of high production rates, autonomous and remote singulation, and a pathway on Moore's Law to consistently demonetizing technology that will improve payback year after year for decades to come. Our next application is order picking, such as in an order fulfillment scenario. Chances are, if you're watching this presentation, you've been to previous ProMat and Modex shows where robotic piece picking demos are pretty common. Everyone knows what I'm talking about, right? A goods to robot workflow in which it picks up one item at a time and immediately places it in an outbound container. What you see here is markedly different. Unlike robotic picking solutions that handle a single item to fill one order at a time, this robot can pick and hold up to 36 items simultaneously while packing four items at a time into four separate shipping boxes. The capability to handle such a large amount of items enables the end effector itself to act as an on-demand buffer according to lean best practices. 
a task once reserved exclusively for accumulation and buffer conveyor, as well as other automated components in the order fulfillment scenarios. For businesses with large amounts of multi-item orders to fulfill, this type of solution can offer significant productivity advantages. The gripper on its own is insufficient, but when coupled with next generation vision and software, it's an example of applying AI and machine learning to solve far more complex problems than previously suitable for automation. Our final stop of robotics applications is palletizing and depalletizing. Why is palletizing and depalletizing so important? The answer lies in a decades-long trend in cost-effective and highly manageable containerization of goods. To ship goods, the most effective modes of transportation are the 20-foot equivalent container unit as well as the 53-foot dry van trailers. Pallets fit perfectly into either of these transport volumes. Then, looking into storing product in a warehouse, and the most volumetrically efficient mode of storage is, you guessed it, it's on a pallet. Today, robots are poised to help with both pallet building as well as breaking down of pallets, but let's take a closer look at palletization in particular. AI is delivering programless robotic solutions that not only feature autonomous motion planning, masterless databases of SKUs containing various metadata information, as well as robust operations, but can also help better coordinate single and multi-SKU palletizing. What makes multi-SKU palletization so difficult is to achieve reliable and consistent pallet builds that are able to be easily transported with high pack integrity. All that is needed is a set of outbound orders delivered to a clustering controller with algorithms to batch by shipping location, the number of items, and package information, such as weight and size, to compute a stable load that outperforms even the most experienced pallet build operators. These algorithms are effectively the material handling equivalent of software tasked with playing a game of 3D Tetris based on the given order profile. The output is a defined sequence fed to upstream material handling equipment according to process requirements so that the large and heavy items are sourced first and the packages are delivered just in time for the robotic palletizing operation to build the pallet load. Now, how many operators can pull that off given the same inputs? It's not many. Add to this the ability to control and prevent carton defect rates due to heavy-handed package manipulation, and robotic palletizing and depalletizing will be a big winner for years to come and a necessary pillar to the Lights Out Warehouse. All right, that's probably enough in the world of robots. Let's take it back over to Chuck and talk a little bit about sortation. Thanks, Brandon. Uh, let's take a minute to talk about some applications of AI and sortation. As we've been talking about the use of AI uh, enabling better functionality in robotics, due to a number of capabilities such as improved vision, object recognition, and improved handling skills through software that learns from its past experience, let's look at a couple of real-world examples with respect to sortation applications. A large challenge for some e-commerce distribution centers is the handling of bulk flow parcels and getting them into a position where they're conducive to sortation. Through the use of vision and learning algorithms, robotics are currently being applied to singulate out, handle a mixed variety of parcels, such as bags, envelopes, and boxes for induction to unit sortation. This is a good example of where traditional algorithms would have difficulty in the variability of the items and how they're recognized and how they're handled. How about another example, uh, this time not related to robotics. Application of intelligent order management allows for smoother flow within the warehouse. To facilitate my point, think of an operation where the workflow moves in bulky fashion through picking, packing, and shipping. Now think of the inefficiencies that exist when workload is light in one area, heavy in another, and always changing. Application of AI when looking at material flow in, where, in uh, a warehouse can help improve productivity by looking at upstream and downstream conditions and releasing and routing orders to make the best use of the assets and the labor. Uh, back to Bruce to talk a little bit about the ASRS. Thanks, Chuck. That was good stuff. 
I'm going to talk a little bit, little bit about how AI and ASRS are coming together in making uh, automatic storage and retrieval systems uh, uh, more flexible and beneficial for operations. The video we're going to watch uh, represents a uh, AMR type technology, uh, coupled with the ability to go up to uh, you know 15 feet in height in the handle totes, and it really is a great application of a buffer storage system and modern control systems coming together to offer further advantages to users. In this case, the ASRS is a buffer of inventory in front of a process to manage flows to this process in a fashion to improve efficiency. So using the WCS, WES level of software, we can optimize the inventory. Of course, if we have too much inventory, we have to pay for that, both in footprint and floor space, extra equipment. But if we have too little, then we're starving the equipment and impacting our ability to serve customers and complete orders. So this all ties back to the WES and WCS level where we can forecast demands and appropriately stock the ASRS with the right materials. When we manage the ASRS, we also want to do this in an efficient way. Uh, we want to put slow movers towards the back of the racks or shelves and fast movers to the front. The ASRS can do this automatically. Uh, it's looking at its past history and can, and can change the, uh, the uh, velocity status of a SKU. Also, when you're moving vehicles back and forth, you want to do this in a uh, very efficient way uh, too as well. You want to have the shortest possible trips. Uh, so the retrieval process can be managed to prioritize pickups based on order profiles uh, and closeness to particular vehicles. Also, you want to perform dual cycles and maximize each vehicle's uh, productivity. So whether the vehicle's carrying one, two, or perhaps up to 10 loads at a time with these new technologies, we want to make sure that we're utilizing each piece of device, each device as efficiently as possible. Without intelligent inventory management, these, these new systems will be less efficient and more costly. Hey, thanks, Bruce. Uh, very interesting stuff. Uh, let's go to Brandon now and talk a little bit about flow management. Yeah, thanks, Chuck. Flow management allows warehouses and MHE equipment to operate efficiently for every system operating point. Has anyone here ever been to a typical logistics hub? If so, you'll know that PPE and specifically earplugs are necessary to spending large periods of time in these facilities. The MHE and total system have been primarily optimized for production and rate. The higher the rate, then the higher the noise levels as well as the electrical consumption within the facility. Logistics providers pay for their systems in sustained rate and peak rate capabilities, but often peaks aren't prevalent for 12 months out of the year. In fact, peak rates may only be in play for one to two months out of the year. So during non-peak production times, it may be much more efficient to slow down the system, lower the electrical consumptions, and turn down the noise levels. Intelligent software for managing flow streams of various MHE promises to do just this, and in addition to the sensors used to properly manage the flows, can give additional data and insights such as item type detection, package counting, verification, and, importantly, traceability. Counting items coming into and out of a facility with a bit more traceability of product going through has extending past energy efficiencies and into core business operations. How so? By knowing what is coming through the system, we can model the flow with machine learning algorithms, and we can even forecast what's coming through tomorrow or in the months ahead. This ability in accurate forecasting assists large players like Amazon in anticipating when to pivot operations such as during annual peaks or during unplanned events such as when COVID originally hit. With accurate forecasting models, an organization is able to update their operation or supply chain 10 steps ahead of their competitors and acquire market share with every unexpected turn because time and time again, AI can predict these events weeks and months ahead of an individual simply looking for patterns in the data. Further yet, the ability to create accurate shipping profiles allows categorizing logistics hubs by demographic and region in addition to time that they're operating and working in. Thus, flow management in this context allows for both equipment optimization as well as organizational and supply chain and planning optimization. 
Next up, we'll take a look at justifying the investment in AI-driven automation technologies. Traditional technology provides a flat or nearly flat operational cost curve over time. But the next generation of automation that's driven by AI can have operational costs that are flat and even declining over time. The subtle change can have a sweeping impact on the rates of automation deployment. Traditional labor-driven approaches stand in stark contrast as they always trend upwards in operating expense over time. This gap will provide a straightened economic function to drive demand for automation to higher and higher levels year after year. In the chart shown, we see the cost of a warehousing facility microfulfillment solution. In this scenario, we're using an ASRS, a few robots, and some other MHE to pull the solution together, and the system is producing as much as 20 operators via traditional means. We can see immediately that the cost of labor is consistently increasing while the automation has a defined payment start and end date with a much lower operational expenditure. For a CapEx model, we can see a large negative outward cash flow at the time of the investment, and as the cumulative cash flow builds, it's offset by the reduction in labor, and crosses zero, we reach our payback period. For the OPEX model, we simply factor in the lease or rental terms and the cost of money in terms of interest rate, and we see that the system is paid back in a similar amount of time before attenuating off towards 5-10% to of the original payment terms. Either of these business models work perfectly well when considering either small or large scale automation deployments. What's different between systems deployed today versus a decade ago is that today equipment installed can actually improve via machine learning and software updates and optimize its performance over time for a reduced total cost of ownership and improved organizational profitability. Okay, so now that we've taken a look at these investment basics when it comes to automation, maybe we should zoom back out and take a look at the broader picture. Chuck, I'm pretty sure you've got some pretty interesting insights when it comes to this. What do you got? Thanks, Brandon. Um, another thing to think about is uh, large businesses can consider a strategy called geographic technology transplantation. This involves decommissioning older automated systems and shipping them to other geographic areas. Making way for the latest technology and deploying the older units can still provide solid value, albeit with higher levels of operator interaction and labor cost. In short, it encourages adoption of new and relocates old technology to comparatively labor-enriched regions. For example, if Japanese manufacturers may invest to use their domestic factories. Cost of land and labor drive them to go for higher levels of automation. They use it to the point they get their payback period, then they redeploy to another area where they have manufacturing, such as the U.S., where land and labor are cheaper. Uh, since they invested in the cutting-edge tech at the time, it still drives value in the secondary deployment. The same principle applies to operations in the U.S. and elsewhere, in which redeploying technology to other markets can still deliver value and make room uh, for even more advanced technology. So uh, I'd like to just take a quick moment to thank everybody for joining us. Uh, our contact information is included for further discussion. Uh, for now, though, we'd love to answer your questions or even host you for a more in-depth individual discussion in our virtual booth. Thanks for joining.